connecting right now. It takes a few seconds to connect always. Uh, oh, come on. Okay, perfect. Connected, redirecting, and then I just need to pause that. And Okay, cool. We're live. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. We're doing another live saddle talk with Jochen Schlesa, where we cover a variety of topics relating to to saddle fit, different types of saddles, and all things about keeping your horse comfortable while they're being ridden under tack. And today we're doing that again. So if any of you guys have questions, you can comment them in the live chat and we'll try to get through them if we have time, but we're just going to get right into it because this is an hour long live and we'll just try to make the most of it. This here is Jochen. I'll let him introduce himself and get started. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to share my screen quick because with the screen share, there's always need to see, um, let me hang on here a second, I'm almost ready, there you go. Yeah, today we talk about, well, how saddle can affect the performance of the horse. Myself, uh, I grew up as a horseback rider. I'm just looking for a specific slide to get this whole thing going, give me a <laughs> minute. All right, almost there. All right, this is my horse. It was a Navarian uh, 173 or 173. Hence, he was um, very young when I got him and I took him to the German championship. We rode Horsa 3D eventing. My passion was always anatomy. I was surrounded by medical doctors. My mom was uh, in the med field, all her uh, brothers and my dad taught physics and math in high school so I was brought up by the saying the person knows the how will always follow the person knows the why and when my horse came up with um, a lameness I was uh, looking for answers and I later on thought rather than I go opinion I'm going to people who really truly understand the horse most veterinarians, their calling is do no harm. They live by the motto. And these three professors here have taught me a lot about the anatomy, physiology, and biomechanics of the horse. So as a master saddler, which I did in Germany, I learned all about how to make saddles. But in the saddle making world, even if they sell, teach you how to sell saddles. They don't teach you necessarily how to make it fit the horse or the rider. They go by what their saddle is. I worked in many different companies and each company has their own um, sales pitch. What they think is so special on their saddle. So here you are, or in this case, I was a saddle maker and says, okay, why would a customer buy your saddle? Well, because of X, Y, Z. And never really was the answer to the question, but why? Not how, but why? So and they showed us how to fit their saddle, but not why their saddle is better for the horse. Huh? Not necessary for the rider, but for the horse. And I thought to get really the answer is to ask uh, professionals, who dedicate their life to the horses, veterinarians who are also riders and uh, point to the top of the horse's back says, well, how you ride the horse is so important. And of course, um, in the end of the day, uh, we have veterinarians who write books about the facial expression, or actually uh, take that back, she didn't write a book about that. She was talking about writing an, an article uh, about facial expression. Many universities now take it up. They call it the ethogram. They can see on the face uh, that horse is not happy. Now, for you folks who grew up with horses, you know when the eyes and ears go back, that horse is not happy. So that's why I always say eyes and ears and mouth don't lie. And if you say, well, he's always like that on Mondays because Sundays he doesn't get ridden and he doesn't like to be ridden Monday. But how come he does it with this one saddle and not with the other saddle? See, that's what people couldn't uh, explain to me. 
And that's why I wrote the book, Suffering in Silence, because there's many horses, you know, they speak, but we as a rider sometimes don't listen to them or we don't understand it. And when, we, when it comes to saddle fitting, oh my God, so many different opinions. I love the scientific facts because that's how I was brought up in the medical field, well, human. And then when I went to veterinarians and asked them, well, how does everything work? And where should the saddle fit? Now they spoke my language because as I said before, my dad was saying the person knows the how will understand the why. So of course we need to understand that there is a lot of fashion and saddle fitting. You know, like I said, I worked in many different saddle companies and everybody else had a different angle how to build saddles. Was it over fashion or belief? Unfortunately, because it's such a confusing subject, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance. You know, deep down we all feel, ah, oh, my equipment hurts or, or, or restrict my horse's movement or proper growing up. You know, and, and then we sweet talk it. We know it's a problem, but we sweet talk it because, well, nobody can help me. Well, that's why I wrote this book. That's why I do what I do. Uh, surrounded by medical doctors who talk to the same thing, how it affects the riders. And we're here now with Shelby to, to help people to understand the interface between horse and rider, the saddle. How can that affect the performance of a horse and, of course, the rider? So that's me. And I hope you guys are here to ask us a lot of questions. We have some topics today, of course. But I know deep down in everybody's heart, people look at their horse, they love their horse, and they do it because they're passionate about it and they love horses. Yeah. Right? So that's, I think that's the hard it. thing. <laughs> that, and that's why the misinformation is so difficult because people get upset if they like have to grapple with the idea that they took advice that could have been harmful to their horse. And then. Isn't that? Uh, the yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Shabby's go right into it with the yeah yeah i think so we can get right started and then i'll i'll keep track of any questions we get and then we can answer them as we go if um like if there's one on the topic that we're on we can answer it while we're on it or we can do it at the end too okay so which topic do you want to start today with shelby i think that um talking about like the differences of fitting like a western saddle versus an english saddle is good because um i have some western and english followers and then there's also some english riders that like to dabble in Western tack as well. So being able to have an idea how to check the fit of both of them and how it varies, I think would be good. Yeah, so when we look at a saddle fitting, you know, if you're a dressage rider or the top right, you see a Western rider here, jumper, eventer, it doesn't matter, right? So for the horse, it's the same thing. Where does the contact come to my back? How does that feel? For the rider, of course, well, my leg is very short because I'm jumping. The flap needs to go more forward, like the stirrup leather is short. My knee goes forward. Western riders, you can see here we got a dressage rider, very relaxed, long leg. Same with the Western riders. Most Western riders ride with a pretty long leg. You don't see them like a jumper rider or, or a jockey, right? So yeah. they have a pretty <laughs> long leg. So, And when we sit in the saddle, Western or English, you know, we, we have the same thing we balance ourselves on our butt so fitting for the rider makes no difference there is approximately 11 different disciplines in western and uh, many many different disciplines in, in english as well but let's start with the seat the basic where you sit on so just like this title says male and female uh rider spinal curves you know we have is humans four curves one in the neck then the upper back, lower back, and then the tailbone. The only main difference in the curve, ladies have a more lordosis, more curvature in the lower back. And of course, when you sit in the saddle, the lady has a different pelvis than the male. One has a birth channel, the other one don't. But in the Western saddle, when I fit a Western saddle, we need to understand first, what's the purpose I want to do? So. Obviously, the hour is not long enough to, to talk about all the different disciplines of the 11 different, different yeah. disciplines. So let's 
talk about the most common one. 78% of all Western riders are trail, adult amateur pleasure riders. Yes, I know that some of you who listens are super competitive as barrel racers or rainers or cutters. I get it. So to, to keep it as a mainstream, um, when we fit in the saddle, start with your ground seat, right? The, the ground seat in the Western saddle or the seat in an English saddle is specific made for two different genders, okay? So once you have fitted the Western saddle, one for the male, one for the female, here, the difference again in the tailbone, typical Western saddle made by man for male has a big cup in the back where your tailbone and your butt cheek sits in, okay? So you're really leaning back into the, well, seat in the cantal area. Mm -hmm. A lady or female has a much shorter tailbone, more curvature and a gluteus maximus, her butt sits higher. So if she would sit in a saddle what is all scooped out for this tailbone and the butt cheek lower, she would fall and collapse back. It would look probably like this pelvis here. See how the red line is parallel to the vertebrae? So that's how would she, uh, the rider sit in the Western saddle made for female. Same thing for the English saddle, all right? So when two skeletons sit on the horse, the butt cheek here on the male, much closer to the horse than on the female, due to the fact of the tailbone and the more door, lower dorsus, in other words, more curvature in the lower back, all right? So that's the fitting to the rider when it comes fit to the horse. Um, we always have to think about, mm, there's many things what changes the horse's anatomy, the three-dimensional shape of the horse's back, okay? As I showed you one of the pictures, my introduction was from Gerd Horschman. He talks a lot about how you train a young horses and ride the young horses versus a more mature horse. In Germany, we call the young horse Vermonte. Vermonte are all young horses qualified under six years. Why is six years such a big name, uh, age? Well, the horse's spine has 32 growth plates and they're close at six years. So different disciplines start at a different age. Yes, in some uh, classes in Western, as well as in English, they start at one and a half or two, and sometimes even later. But let's say when a horse develops, okay, they change the horse's back because A, the gross plate change and close, and C, all these factors, these are the main, they're, they're more, you can go way more in detail, but the way you train your horse, there's different trainers who approach it. Shelby, you being a trainer, you have seen a mm -hmm. couple of your colleagues who train horses and you're professional, you don't say anything, but you just raise your eyebrows and say, that's not <laughs> how I would do it. <laughs> yeah. Right, so there's, different way how trainers approach it and tack on the bottom here. You know, there's different ways how saddles are fitted. Now, when it comes to horse training, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's been written down for 2,500 years by the man by Xenophon. He has proven and written it down to his soldiers. He was a Greek militarist how to train a horse so his horse lasts and they're sustainable without crippling them before they even reach the age of six. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is a method, as I said, we don't need to retrain it in tack, in saddles. Well, there's, uh, it's not a regulated trade and um, there is a lot of opinion, as I said. I like to follow what makes sense and what has the horse and the human in mind Long term, not short term or fashion or by opinion. So I follow the uh, scientific uh, proved evidence, uh, saddle fitting, and not some opinion. So obviously, if I train incorrectly or I fit this horse incorrectly, that changes the saddle a lot. Now, what has that to do with Western saddle versus English saddle? Well, not a lot, but the way the saddle is dispersing the weight on the horse's back is a massive difference, 
huge difference. I just threw this slide up first to give you an idea of how many factors changes a three-dimensional horse's back, okay? So farriers, age condition, how heavy or light the rider is, how experienced or unexperienced the rider is, veterinarian and body work, et cetera, et cetera. So when we look at the weight-bearing surface for the um, Western saddle versus an English saddle, here is um, two saddles, a typical English tree. And here is the saddle before they became Western saddles. They were big, big uh, army saddles, or they used it in China a lot, or in the Middle Ages, you know, where the knight in shining armor was sitting on. Mm -hmm. You see how much more the weight bearing surface are the bars of the tree versus the bars of the tree on the English. So the Western saddle has a horn, the bars are a little bit narrower than those old fashioned army saddles. But I look at the weight bearing surface, look from the top. Mm -hmm. How much more weight bearing surface a Western saddle has versus an English saddle? Okay, so the bars are much smaller. Where an English saddle needs what we call a saddle panel, the stuffing, to um, make sure that these narrow bars are nicely padded. Some of the English saddles have a second tree. Okay, you see the outline right there. Okay. So that gives you the same weight bearing surface as the old army saddles. So that call actually an adapt tree. So they have one tree for the rider, nice and narrow for the twist. And then that blue one, nice and wide weight bearing surface for the horse. When I'm going to the horse and I says, hmm, I want to fit the horses back. Okay, so let's say first, before we put a Western or English saddle on, what am I trying to fit? I'm trying to fit that the horse can move freely without muscle being squished or shoulders being crippled. So this bump you see there and there and there and there, that's the shoulder blade. What the horses move, like I do here, this is how the horse walks. The shoulder blade rotates upwards, backwards. Okay, so. And down here, you can see how the muscle contracts and then their contracts, right? So the shoulder moves upwards, backwards. Here's a, um, a horse would lift the leg up by itself. You can see how the upper arm pushes the shoulder back. So a Western saddle or an English saddle, both of them have to sit where the main ends, it's right there. Okay, that's where the front of the tree sits. The English saddle, very easy, where your D-ring is. Western saddle, okay, this is not a Western saddle, it's just army saddle, but the only difference between this saddle tree and a Western saddle tree would be, there would be horn on it, the swell would be lower, and the bars would be somewhat narrow, but the principle are the same. So right here where the swell ends, there's the concho. So your first concho has to be where the main ends. Then the front tree, this part of the tree, this is called the bars. That's where they used to hang uh, their guns or their ropes or their water bottles. These bars would sit on the horse's back, being extended to the front, not to put pressure on the horse, to put stuff on the top of the horse on the saddle, such as I said. In the front, most of the time, it's the water bottle, the guns, the rope, part of the weight you want to distribute it. So they hover above the horse. So they're actually sitting above the bone. They don't touch, okay? So that the shoulder can slide under. Then the bars, you can see the yellow, the white line here. It's not a lot of weight bearing surface on top of the rib cage. The Western saddle would cover those whole weight-bearing surface. So that's why in general, Western horses in general have way less kissing spine than English horses. Why? Because look at how little the bars are versus there. So every horse what has been written, and if we go with the theory of xenophon or with nature's 
theory. When the horse's neck goes down, the horse's nuchal ligament system lifts the rib cage. A good rider lifts the back, brings the haunches underneath, and the horse is free, and the weight comes off the forehead. So when the back lifts, see how all these bones stick? Uh, they're not touching anymore. Mm -hmm. That's what the whole holy grill of training is. Get the horses back up so the spinal processes don't touch. The horse neutral. See how they all fall forward and they stand straight? Here they fall back. So they're very, very close neutral, which means and when the horse just is relaxed. A loaded back, I'm going to use my hand. As soon as you put weight on it, it will go down. So if the back goes down, all these bones will touch. Okay, so back to this question, what's the difference between fitting a Western saddle and an English saddle? On a Western saddle, these bars sit over the entire area, more pounds per square inch. They have a Navajo pad. They don't need a big, cushy uh, saddle pad okay? because the bars already have so little pounds per square inch because it's spread. Mm -hmm. An English tree, narrow bars, very narrow. They need a lot of cushioning because there is a less pounds per square inch. So the pressure is higher on an English saddle given the fact that the rider weighs the same, okay? Now, how do I fit an English saddle in the front? Well, if I have a jumping saddle or dress saddle or eventing saddle, the leather doesn't put any pressure on the shoulder, okay? They, the leather or the panel, they just maybe restrict the movement a little bit, but they don't put pressure on it. The Western saddle, this bar, what flows on top, Okay, that front flare. I always like to say, think of a pencil or pen like that thick, like, like a pinky thickness maybe, okay? Not a big pen, just a narrow pen or pencil. And you want to slide that in the front bar where my mouse is. You want to, when that Western style is on the horse, you want to be able to slide that pen through it. Let me bring a Western tree up here. Cool. I'll keep an so eye here's on. the western tree. This was where the concho is. The main should end here. Okay, the main would end there, and this bar is on the shoulder. But while the saddle is on, no Navajo pad, no rider, no no cinch, just sits there. You should slide your pen, okay, all the way to see where the rose is there. Mm -hmm. You should slide the pen up and down, easy. It should flare away. That front flare needs to not touch the horse's shoulder. If my knuckles are the shoulder, you want to see that space, mm -hmm. okay? So if there is massive amount of space, like a big marker, okay? The flare is too big and the saddle becomes unstable, okay? Or they, all kinds of stuff gets in between. If you can't slide the pen through it, I guarantee you, your horse will have a lot of problems to move the shoulder. So you see tripping, um, doing very tiny steps. And the worst part is you damage the horse's shoulder. Okay, so that is uh, from a Western saddle. With the English saddle, if the bars are not wide enough and the padding is not properly, see how that D-ring is behind the shoulder blade? That's where the main would end, okay? How is that shoulder going to go through that? If the flare on the Western saddle is not big enough or the tree on the English saddle is not wide enough, this is a close-up of the horse's shoulder. That's cartilage, same stuff your nose and ears are made of. So when the shoulder goes back, you're gonna cripple all that. Okay? You will end up with a horse what will really get super tight and the motion will decrease to the part where the whole spine fuses. Look at the horse's neck, completely uh, dissipate, no muscle, no top That's line, crazy. and all these spines are completely fused. There's no movement here. Everything is fused. 
So this is an Arab, an Arab known as having the highest thresholds in terms of pain. <laughs> so it is incredible what these horses go through. But when I can give a little tip, what to fit in an English saddle versus a Western saddle, both horses, you got to get the back up. The haunches can come underneath, then they can stretch, and the shoulder can slide through without digging and crippling the cartilage. So that's the front part of the saddle when we fit uh, a saddle to a Western saddle versus an English saddle. What I like about Western saddles, all Western saddles, here you see a Western saddle from the bottom, have a nice wide bar. Mm -hmm. So that means looking from the back, this is really wide. Unfortunately, we see many, many English saddles where the stuffing, okay, remember when I was talking about the stuffing, is way too narrow. So why is that so important? This muscle here, this is a multifidus muscle. And here is a lumbar. And the multifidus muscle is like my fingers. So it's right beside this bone and this bone, right on the spine. And if you want your horse to last a long, long time, and you want your horse to jump nicely as a jumper or as a dressage horse, bends, make sure that panel, the stuffing in the back is nice and wide apart. Unfortunately, too many saddles are way too narrow in the channel when it comes to English. In the Western saddle, this is so cool. In the Western saddle, there's not a single Western saddle where the, where the um, gusset or the panels or the tree, this here, okay, where that is narrow than a man's fist. Unfortunately, <laughs> if we fit English saddles, this is what I'm talking about, the yeah. spacing on the spine, it has to be a fist wide. And why is it that English thought like why is it that whoever started making English saddles that they just kind of gave up I guess and didn't do the width the same as like with western saddles if it's more like commonplace in the western world um okay so there is three main comments the, the people uh, who make them that narrow they say it doesn't matter because that doesn't touch the horse and then when you do a dust ride like you see here, you can see all the dust marks on top of the spine. Obviously, it dust touches the spine. And a horse is ridden with an English saddle, what has a nice white channel, given that it fits everywhere else. Most of the time, choose and relax. As soon as you put a saddle on with a narrow gusset, you see horses, again, white eyes, ears pinching. So why is the company doing it? Is it because... There's, they don't believe, right? There's many styles like this where you barely get three, three, four fingers in. Yeah. Not even a fist. Some of the really old ones are like almost two even. Like, yeah. like they're, yeah, it's insane. And, you know, you can talk to these manufacturers and you can show them these pictures were not published by me, by veterinarians. Mm -hmm. You know, they says, go ahead and ride with your saddle with your narrow gullet. And after you've ridden, massive pressure on the spine, all the heat. It only leads to spinal surgery. Yeah? And as I said, very few um, Western horses have kissing spine. A lot of English horses have kissing spine. Kissing spine, you say, yeah, I can operate it. You know, they just cut these apart. But the whole stone here, okay, they get narrow. They should be as, as big as this green circle. Mm -hmm. And if that gets narrow, you can't operate that. Oh, maybe he has spondylosis. Oh, maybe he's a wobbler. Maybe, 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 maybe you stay off the horse's spine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so back to, to your question, why do people do it? It's easier to sell, okay? I can tell if I fit the saddle, what they call in the industry, the close pin fit. Mm -hmm. I can fit that saddle almost to any horse right, without adjustments. And a close pin fit means it's narrow in the gullet. This is the multifidus muscle I was showing you earlier. Okay, that's where the muscle sits. So it sits on that muscle. 
which the horse immediately hates. And it hits all these nerves, the blood vessel, the nerves, they all come out of the spine. Okay? And then the saddle hangs off the spine like a clothespin, hence the word clothespin fit. And the tree can be nice and wide. You think he moves well? Well, he moves well for a bit, but not until he deforms and he goes hollow. And that is why I cannot stand that clothespin fit. Here's another good uh, view of a calcification. See how that all grows together? Oh my God. So it's white cool. hair or white hair or uh, a big leg, tendon, it, it heals. That doesn't heal anymore. Now it's not a pain for the horse because they don't feel it. It's just take the mobility away. That's so sad. Right. So what, what really hurts me is when I see horses like this, you know, you say, hey, that horse doesn't look bad. Look at the confirmation. You know how many, many, many horses have this holding line here? So mm -hmm. that comes very often if on the Western saddle, the back, this is the back of the Western saddle here, the back flare, it's not a pencil thick. So the same thing, the absolutely same thing what you did with the shoulder. Shelby, can you see the different color in the hair here in the flank? Yeah, he's darker near the back there. That's right. So all horses have that. They call it the ring of lights. So English saddles or Western saddles should never put pressure there. Now, Western saddle all sit in that area, but they shouldn't put pressure there. So the cantle, that means this part here on the Western saddle, okay, should not get past that area. So it should never be in the dark area where the bars can be. So long the pen slides through the back. So summarization, put the saddle on the horse without the pad, without the girth, without the rider. Does this end in front of the dark area right there where the mouse is? Mm -hmm. And then these, of course, are in the dark zone. Does my pants slide through easy? If it's too much, it looks like the saddle is hovering about the horse. Okay. That doesn't hurt the horse. It just looks crazy, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> If it's too little, the horse will get a holding line. That means you have pressure on this little bone. Look how thin that bone is. And look how thick my pen is. Oh my God. That's a very thin bone. And if this English saddle or Western saddle fits on it, then you got this horses and they're holding themselves. So here's a, a typical case of a holding line. And you see that you see a lot of Western horses have that bump. Okay? So you can so easily avoid it because in general, it's an easier saddle to fit. So long, I always say, do the pen thing. Right? Everybody can afford to buy a pen or, or <laughs> ask their son or their daughter to bring a pencil from school. Right? So if you slide the pencil through the shoulder and through the dark zone there, you're already home free with your Western saddle because most Western saddle have a nice wide spine. Here, this one had a narrow, narrow gullet and atrophied this entire back. That was an English saddle. That's so Absolutely sad. horrible. So there's one more trick with the Western saddle and English saddle. That trick is what I call the triangle trick. So this is a cross section right where the main ends. And you can see there's a massive, massive dry spot. And you can see the dry spot is on top of the shoulder. So that tells me that the English saddle, okay, was too far forward. You see this with a lot of jumper saddles. Yeah. Right? Right? They damage the shoulder. Or if it's a Western saddle, you see this a lot. If the flare, the pen width was not there. You know, and the worst part is the more pads you put underneath correction pads, the worse you make it, right? The arc of the bars are so important. So what I want you to, to look also is end of the main, you should have a hand width 10 centimeter or four inches back to this. I call that the triangle and there is dry spot. Dry spots, people say, oh, 
That means it doesn't touch. Yeah, could be one option. Or the other option is it's too much pressure. And it's a very easy trick if you have dry spots, if you want to know if this is a problem. All you have to do is wash that area, put water on it, and watch how it dries. Does the whole area dries even? Or does the dry spot whoop, instantly go dry? That means there's a lot of heat, a lot of pressure, a lot of soft tissue damage already happening. All right, so that's a great trick on your dry spot. So back to the triangle thing. The distance from the top of the withers to the start of this muscle longissimus, okay, that's 10 centimeter. Okay. That's again, four inches or a man's hand width. Mm -hmm. So when you fit the saddle to the horse, start with the Western saddle, you stick your pen under the fork and then like a windshield wiper, you want to go back and forth here. And okay. you want to see if the pen four inches down, slides through the saddle, same thing, not girth up, no saddle pad on top, no rider, okay? Does the pen slide away? Look at these three muscles, rhombosius, trapezius, spinalis. All these muscles, they run here with your neck. And if something bites your neck on the side, your, your traps, you can get very headachy, you're very cranky. So think about somebody would cut you or push you in the neck there, okay? So how do I fit my English saddle? Same thing, I put the pen on where the main ends and like a windshield wiper, I go back and forth, okay? Is that free? If it's not, mm -hmm. your tree is too narrow or in the Western saddle, the bars are too close. See, in the old days, it was easy because the Western saddle was only made for quarter horses okay? or for a specific type of horse. And we had a quarter horse fit, semi-quarter horse fit. Now we have an Arab fit, but we also have, like you said, Shelby, we have a lot of horses, uh, mm -hmm. riders who now says, I want to go Western now. Yeah, like thoroughbred people. I find it like hard there to you go. It. Yeah, there thoroughbreds you go. and warm bloods. Right, so <laughs> they're not made for it. Because on the, on the um, court, look at how this ground seat slopes. It slopes backwards because the quarter horses are higher in the butt. Mm -hmm. Now the ground seat is level. Now you put it on the thoroughbred or some warm bloods who are really uphill or Frisians, look where the rider sits. They're, they're, they're water skiing, right? <laughs> so it's like the balance is off. So as I said, in the old days, it was really, really easy to fit a Western saddle because there was a specific horse that saddle was made for it. Today, and we're very happy about it because Western saddles are now also made for other breeds, not just for quarter horses and Arabs. Okay? So very, very important. What I want to bring home today is if you want to avoid the deformity on the spine, the holding That's line, horrible. and the deformity through here. If you don't remember anything I say, <laughs> think about stay away from the shoulder. How do I stay away from the shoulder when I stay away from these two points? The top point is the cartilage I showed you. The lower point is this point. This is the lung meridian point. Okay. And all these points have something to do with the respiratory health of your horse. So if you're into high sports or into pleasure, I guarantee you, you don't want to have a horse what has breathing problems because that is just an accelerating um, issue to have unnecessary ulcer or colic for your horse. So that is all clinical and data uh, researched. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for um, how can I avoid less stress to the horse. So if I avoid those points I just pointed out for horse and rider, then English or Western saddles, the horse will thank you for it. It's a long, long 
answer <laughs> yeah i have a question too that kind of plays into this like that someone asked they were wanting to know what uh what to look out for when you're buying a horse like related to like back health so if you're like shopping like what are some red flags that they could look at to go like okay this is a horse that if i'm gonna get they might need vet work or i should pass on this horse or this horse needs to do more of this this or that to be sound or um yeah okay so I'm going to answer this uh, from a saddle maker point of view. You can answer it from a trainer point of view. Okay. <laughs> I can um, tell you a little bit what I was looking for when I was buying horses as an eventer. Okay. So, and then maybe you can chime in to, to mm -hmm. help from your side a little bit. So when I'm looking for horses uh, from a saddle maker view, the horse on the left, it's an easy fitting horse. Why? Mm -hmm. Because it has a long back. It has a broad shoulder. Okay. And it doesn't have a high, high with this. And um, that was the average warm blood for a horse that were bred for an all round horse. Because these horses from the past, they were also plowing the fields. You know, they were also ridden and driven. It was what was called an all-round horse. And saddle making really, really accelerated. And tree manufacturers and the manufacturers of saddle making was when that horse was out there. So all these new horses we have now are these. Super narrow chest, super long legs, super high withers, sh super short backs. And with the short back, that means all these trees, what's out there, they don't fit anymore. They're so long. So when I buy a horse for competition and I want to win, I buy the horse on the right. Why? Because they're more electric. They're more athletic. They're very sensitive. They're very fast. From a saddle maker point of view, what a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> because they're so sensitive. Everything hurts. You'll have to be careful what saddle pads and girth and how you fit the saddle. They're not as robust as these horses. So when we talk about the length of the saddle, that's a typical saddle for the old horse, which is now way too long for the new horse. Here's again yeah. the dark zone in the back. And under the dark zone, you see the narrow bones. So that's... Um, Looking from a saddler's point of view, I would look always for a horse what is a little longer in the back, okay, a little sturdier in the chest, okay, and then maybe you can now add your points in what you would look from a trainer point of so view. So for me, like I get a lot of horses off the racetrack. So like when I'm buying projects, a lot of my projects are not muscled up in the way that you want as like a sport horse. Um, so like I, when I'm looking at them, I kind of expect to see like some level of like atrophy along the back and like an under neck and stuff. Cause I already know they're not being ridden properly if they are, are broke. But with that said, like if I found a horse who had like white scarring all over its back and there was like clear tension through the back where they started to have like a roach and stuff or really, really bad atrophy on a horse who is supposed to be doing moderate to high levels of exercise those are all things where i would have to factor it in like if i was buying a horse i would go like okay this horse is five thousand dollars and he has this this and that i'm not willing to pay that or and pay to vet check him because i have a high risk of it turning up something that i probably don't want to deal with whereas if the horse is like four hundred dollars i'll go okay whatever i'm willing to take this risk let's see if we can fix it um but yeah, mainly I go off of their muscle and like their body structure and how they move because every like whether it's saddle related or not, I found that it like all plays together because some of the racehorses will have like saddle fit issues and they'll also be carrying themselves really hollow because of how they're ridden and the discomfort of the saddle. And then also like bad farrier issues and stuff where they're not moving correctly because their feet are so long and underrun and stuff. So there, there's like a whole like laundry list of issues that I factor in but basically like it depends on price what the horse's intended use is and like how many red flags they have um, depending on how I would deal with it because 
I like as a trainer, I'm probably willing to take on more risk than what a person who's shopping for the, like their lifelong show horse would. So it's a little bit different for me. Um, and if I was helping a student buy, I'd probably be even more careful. Yeah. So maybe I can add a couple more things mm -hmm. to, to see because we talk about kissing spine before. This was a horse that went for a quarter of a million euros, right? And um, it left one barn and went to the other, and then it ended mm -hmm. up in, um, was a high, high dressage horse in Zurich. And wow. um, this horse here uh, just shut down, you know? And after they x-rayed it, yeah, they saw all the white marks here. You talked about white marks, okay? But if you see a horse with, I call them these hunter bumps or these up and down bumps and wrong muscles here. Okay. You're dealing with a lot, a lot of wrong trained horses. So in the old days, and uh, I know um, some Grand Prix trainers, friend of mine who says, you know, we didn't know what we didn't know. We thought that was good. Now we know, oh my God, I have trained this horse completely wrong. Right, so this is a upside down horse, a horse that is compensated a lot. This horse had a lot of SI joints problem and a lot of kissing spine and atrophy through the shoulder. Okay. Check out this, what I call oh holding line. If a horse has that holding line, right, you definitely want to stay away from that. Or these uh, lines through the, these are uh, muscle, uh, which completely seized up. Obviously, this is an extreme case. This is a racehorse from New Zealand. That's insane. I've never seen anything like that. Before. Yeah, and it was still going very fast, you know, and it was then sold to a jumper barn. And people say, you know, he has a lot of attitude, but boy, can he jump. Oh and, um, and he's fast. But he dealt with a lot of pain. You know, yeah. if, if, Holy. If, if you don't, have a quarter of a million to lose or don't want to buy a horse for 400 and and <laughs> deal with all the vet checks like you said you know stay away from uh, wrinkled skin atrophy white hair or dry spots it's a it's a great giveaway i mean for for a um, professional you know for a chiropractor physiotherapist veterinarians they can detect this when they have this severe uh, uh, separation of the uh, pubis symphysis, this is uh, super painful. Many horses get ridden like this. You see oh a lot gosh. of horses. They say, oh, look how big muscles they have. Yeah, but look on top how the SI joints are pinched. Supposed mm -hmm. to be free like this one. Yeah, look from oh behind gosh. if they stand square and one hip is higher than the other. So these are uh, great indicators where you want to maybe step back and say, no, I'm not going to buy this horse. Yeah, if the price is right, the color is great. But if you buy it, you end up with a lot of uh, issues in terms of riding, training, behavior. And of course, good luck with the, with the saddle fitting. If you train horses, okay, you can avoid all this. Sure, you could say, well, my horse uh, somersaulted out of the trailer by unloading or I had a trailer accident. I get it, okay? Trauma can happen. But this can also happen through wrong training and wrong equipment, okay? Many, many saddles, shifts to the right. Many, many people do not address the right shift of the saddle. And when you buy a horse and he stands square, he can't even stand on the track. So look from behind. Run your fingertips. Run your fingertips on top of the spine. A vertebrae rotation, you can detect. You don't need to be a super duper veterinarian. I mean, it sticks really out. Same with the ribs. You know, that horse would not even let you touch him. Right? He, he would say, oh, get away from me. Oh, yeah, he's ticklish, but he's a nice guy. Well, be careful. Right? So if you try to ride him and after riding, the owner who wants to sell it and says, oh, no, it's okay. These bumps disappear after 20 minutes. Okay. There's many reasons why they're there, but good luck. When you touch you. them, are they hard or are they like no, jelly? They're like jelly. They're super soft and they disappear after 20 minutes. Okay. Many horses, 
And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Many horses are stronger on the left side. They're higher, right? The left shoulder is bigger. Many horses. So don't be alarmed when you get a horse and say, oh my God, this horse is like really super uh, uneven. Let me see if I have another uh, slide maybe which shows it better. So you're standing behind and you can see how it stick out on one side. And what you can't see, even for veterinarians and, and chiropractors, to hard detect is this transitional vertebrae. So they have this bump in the back. So on the right side is higher than the left. Here's the downside with this, okay? Normally the nerve, the spinal nerve goes underneath the bone. If a horse has a transitional vertebrae, it goes on top. And that makes that area super sensitive. If you're a Western rider and you have your saddle and you says, boah, I can't even turn my horse to the right or to the left. I have the pencil clearance, but just the Navajo pad sitting on it makes them already nuts, crazy. So really stand them up, look from behind, which side is bigger, okay? Expect to see the majority of the horses bigger on the left, okay? If you jump or you ride, have a friend, film you, videotape yourself in their saddle and your saddle doesn't matter, okay? This is not normal like this white horse here. You shouldn't jump like that. <laughs> you know, yeah, no, that's crazy. You, you shouldn't fall off that side. Western or English doesn't matter. So these are the little tips. Um, what I can give to, to avoid, of course, these swelling. These are hard, so those are the hard ones. You can cut them out, you know, this, this ones. But most of the time, um, I call them the vet, and they will say, oh, that could be calcium deposit, parasites, or ingrown hair. Cause for many reasons. So if you buy a horse, you have a lot of dealing to do with this. So I go through it. This one here is my number one go to this pain line. Mm -hmm. I would be super careful to buy that horse. Yeah. Okay, so I want to know. Why this horse has this in a racetrack, they call that fit line. Okay, why is that fit line there even though the horse is not ridden? Or why is it there when it's ridden? I need to know what's going on. So we know from the um, veterinarian side, there is a nerve, what calls the cranial nerve 11. When you hit that nerve, that's when um, that comes out. All right, so we don't want to have a saddle. Here you see the nerve goes through there. And when you saddle pinches, that nerve is tight and it shows that line on the sh shoulder. Super careful. And on the back, that's a different line. That's a, um, the holding line on the flank. So these are the ad additional points I wanted to point out to your question earlier. That's crazy. Wow. That's such good information though. Cause a lot of this stuff is like fairly subtle from the standpoint of like a lot of horses have it. So it's not really like you're seeing so many well-conditioned horses where you just go, Oh my God, this is so far off what I'm used to seeing. So yeah. I think people start tuning it out unless they see like the specifics of it. True. Um, and you're absolutely right. The people do tune it out because it's overwhelming. I did find this picture here. Where I wanted to uh, go back to the earlier question if we have time. Yep. You, you were saying about the difference between Western saddle fit and English saddle fit. Yeah. The English saddle sits between line two and line four. Mm -hmm. And the Western saddle sits between line one and line five. Mm -hmm. However, the Western saddle, like the English saddle, should only put pressure between line two and line four. And the pencil what I showed you earlier should slide easy between line four and line five in one and two. Okay. That's where the front bars and the back bar on the trees on the Western side is. That I think it's a nice summarization. Why Western side is bigger. And while they're both English and Western have the contact on top of the rib cage, the Western goes longer, but it hovers over the, flank and then over the shoulder. It's a nice picture, isn't it? 
Yeah, no, that's really good information because I did always wonder why Western saddles could cover a bigger area of the back mm-hmm. and not have it be an issue. Does having like a back cinch versus not wearing one change the fit of the saddle at all? Or is that just kind of preference depending on how much you're doing and how much the saddle is moving around? Yeah, so the back cinch is only there. Look how much soft tissue there is. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when you squish the guts and the muscles, if that thing is tight, should never be tight. It should mm-hmm. lay on it, okay? Rather looser than too tight. So for whatever reason, the rope hits hard on the horn, the saddle doesn't flip over. Yeah. If you do a lot of rope work, or you like the look, or you ride a lot of uphill and downhill, <laughs> Yeah. go ahead and do the back cinch, right? Oh, it has to be traditional, the back cinch. Do the back cinch. So long mm-hmm. you keep it soft, because all this you can squish. Yeah. The, okay. The I want to talk about this middle line quick. That's where you sit. That's your balance line, which is at the end of the sternum of the horse. Here's the blue line. Every bareback rider, rodeo rider, western dressage rider, you need to be on the spot where you can feel in balance. Okay. Mm-hmm. So if you go jumping, your knee goes forward because your foot goes shorter. The stirrup leather is short. If you do cutting. You know, and the horse goes down, okay? That goes down because it almost mm-hmm. crouches and lowers itself down to look a cow in the eye. I mean, if you look at the cutting horses, how much higher they are in the rump versus the front. Oh, yeah. Right? So then obviously the whole uh, balance changes because this whole balance issue is. Mm-hmm. Same with the racing or, or barrel racing or English racing horses. But this point here, I call the neutral point. From here, I need to be able to swing my leg forward or back, my upper body forward or back without losing where I'm sitting, the Mm -hmm. center of the horse. Yeah, so that's pretty much the the explanation why we want to have that saddle sit on that long muscle and keep away from the triangle I was mentioned earlier, the windshield wiper trick with the pen. That's awesome. No, that's such good information. And it gives people really easy means of checking like a bunch of things. Oh. And yeah, good for me too, for Western saddles, because I do sometimes ride Western. So cool. Yeah. Thank you again so much for doing this. And it's always a pleasure to have you on here and learn so much. And yes, yeah, it's, it takes us sometimes a little bit further away from what we talked earlier. But yeah. um, I think that one question was really good you asked earlier about what to look for when you buy saddle yeah. horses yeah and i think yeah that it, it gives people a nice variety of things to take with them when they mm-hmm. um go and learn more yeah maybe next one we can do on the saddle what to look yeah. for by use saddle that would be great yeah and like different types of saddles and what to avoid and like yeah, yeah. Es- especially like on different budgets i think would be cool because yeah Good. perfect Thank you so much. Have a lovely day. And thank you you again for sharing your expertise.